would first like to start off by saying that science is a collaborative endeavor. Uh, and so I'd really like to thank my co-authors, uh, Zhang Zhao Sun, Laura Shearer, Holly Gibbs, Arnold Tucker, Martin Bruckner, and Seth Spornley, and the team at the Environmental Science this is at the University of Leiden, uh, and the jury, of course, for going through the process of selecting the, the prizes. So I'm going to instantly upgrade the name of the talk to a great food transition, because that's how big it has to be. It has to be a massive transition. And one of the reasons for this is the food system on its own produces between a quarter and a third of all global greenhouse gas emissions. And even if we decarbonize the energy system, we put in all the wind turbines, we put in the solar, we put in all the technologies that we need, the food system alone will be enough to push us beyond 1.5 and perhaps even 2 degrees of warming, let alone the fact that the food system impacts all these other planetary boundaries too. It's the biggest single driver of biodiversity loss, one of the biggest drivers of freshwater pollution, air pollution, uh, nitrogen uh, over, uh, overflows, which actually cause aquatic death. So we really need to address the food system and address it quickly. So what's this great food transition all about? There's three main pillars. Dietary change, mostly to plant-rich diets, a reduction in food waste, and an improvement in production. But no matter which paper that you look at, it all ends up looking the same way. These are not created equal. Take a look at the opportunity here. On the right-hand side of this, on the, on this slide, you can see a figure showing the bar on the very left, and that shows the total emissions to the end of this century in a business as usual for the food system. Now look at the different interventions across the x-axis. And you can see that better than higher yields, better than halving, wa um, halving waste, better than high efficiency, plant-rich diets is the one that stands out the most in reducing those emissions by an over half. And this is critically important in high-income nations, because in high-income nations, most of our emissions come from the, uh, the ag animal agriculture in the food system. But this shift could provide another benefit, too, that's often overlooked. Because animal agriculture occupies about 80% of all of our ag agricultural lands, we use about 30% of crops to feed animals, and about 60% in the EU alone, then that means that it uses up a huge amount of land, about 35% of global habitable land. And we just don't have that land to spare. We need that land for so many other things that we've heard about from uh, Johan Rockström earlier, uh, from Carlos as well, in terms of protecting biodiversity. And so if we were able to save this land, and we were able to revert it to natural vegetation, we would get a double carbon dividend. We'd be able to draw down carbon on land. So let's have a look at what that looks like. This is the picture now, and this is much less carbon, it's much less able to absorb floodwaters, and compare it to this picture here, a rewilding project in the UK. And you can see all of the carbon being stored on that land, the flood wall protection. It also allows us to roll with the blows of climate change. This is far more resilient than the system that we currently have, while reducing emissions and being healthier generally for us, let alone the biodiversity, the clean air, the clean water, all those other things, the pandemics, all the other things that I've already, uh, I've already talked about. So in our research, we looked at how large these benefits would be. First of all, we had a look at the emissions themselves, so how much would the emissions reduce just by changing your diets? And we found an over 60% reduction in agricultural emissions across high-income nations. And that's shifting to a plant-rich diet. That's not cutting out meat completely. Uh, that's something in the order of a small burger every two weeks, something of that sort of order. Now then, we mapped where that land would be saved upstream in the supply chain. We have these big global models to look at where in the supply chain land is being used to produce the crops, uh, to do the ranching, to feed us. And we found that you would double that benefit. That figure that you saw earlier, that green bar that reduced over half, you could see that same amount again over this century if you were able to save that land and be able to rewild you would save an area roughly the size of the EU by the high-income nations alone moving to plant-rich diets. Remember, not plant-based, but plant-rich diets. That would be about 14 years of global agricultural emissions today. So I think that's a really hopeful message in terms of how we could rewild, how we could protect biodiversity, meet many of our goals, and stay within the planetary boundaries by this one change. But if nobody hears about it, 
you know, how did they find out about it? So the next point, part was acting on our work. So encouraging journalists to cover the message of the paper. Talking to journalists, talking to the media, trying to get them involved. Working with NGOs and legal teams to spread the policy opportunity of joining health, biodiversity, carbon, all these different sectors and all these different policy makers together to get a situation which is better for the planetary health and better for our health too. Same thing with policymakers and meeting with policymakers and incorporating the double dividend. I mean, this is in the UK, and the UK is one of the most degraded nations on the planet when it comes to nature. And a lot of the high income nations are very, very degraded. We talk about biodiversity being in low and middle income nations, but that's partly because we've already degraded R so much in high income nations. And I say that R is somebody coming from a high income nation. So perhaps that's one of the areas where we should also be looking in terms of taking the load off biodiversity protection by changing the ways in which we consume and the way in which we produce food. Talking to um, policymakers, it's also important to talk about personal action. I mean, if we're so concerned as scientists about the future and about the way in which we're going, and we're not taking things seriously, how do we expect others to take things seriously too? So it's also about talking about the changes that we're making in our lives as a response to the research that we're doing, what the research is telling us. So talking about this move towards going vegan, cutting out flying, not to shame anybody, but just to say, hey, we're really, really concerned by this. And we're so concerned about this, we can't live with ourselves doing these, doing, having these uh, practices. And finally, teaching and supporting students. Some of my students have gone on to work in land systems management. They've gone on to work with farmers, gone on to work with uh, large-scale unions uh, of farmers. And so you often forget the downstream effects you can have uh, later on uh, in, in the world with the students going out there. So in terms of uh, using uh, the money from the Frontiers Prize, we'll be using it to accelerate a rapid food transition. We are moving into a very rocky period in terms of the food system. Uh, climate impacts are emerging earlier than thought, but not only that, but the extreme weather events on the climate system uh, have largely been underestimated over time, much like we were talking about earlier in terms of the large-scale uh, impacts. So we need this rapid food transition, not only to reduce these emissions, protect the planetary boundaries, but also be more resilient, because we've got other work that looks at how plant-based rich diets can be more resilient too. So we will be looking at where subsidies are and how to shift them. This is not an easy sociological problem, so how do we take the money that's already there and shift it towards uh, beneficial outcomes for everyone? How to ease this transition for farmers and consumers? Farming, a lot of the time, in many nations, is a precarious, difficult job. So how do we give people options? Nobody likes to be told what to do, so how do you give options in order to harness this benefit? Look at the impacts of this in terms of the changes in food trade and international equity. It's all very well saying, okay, we're going to reduce uh, you know, our, our intake, but what upstream effects might that have on other countries around the world? And how to incorporate social tipping points and accelerate change. We know from research that between, if between about 15 and 40% of a minority adopt a new habit, you can flip the majority. And we're starting to see the inklings of that now in the food system, just like we saw the inklings of that with solar and wind about 10 uh, to 20 years ago now. So it's a very exciting time. So that's what we'll be working on in this rapid food transition lab to move towards this hopeful food, food, food future that's more resilient and has lower impacts. Thank you very much. That was so interesting. Thank you so much. And just one question for you, which is, so if you're going to rewild a lot more land, where is the land going to come from that you are going to grow the, the crops that you need for an increased plant diet? Well, what's wonderful is that when you grow the crops, it's far more efficient. Uh, we waste between about 80 and 97% of the calories going through animals. So basically, we save all of this land, 30% uh, of crops going to animals, and then we only use a tiny amount of that land to grow the crops we need. And some of those crops are also carbon sequestering too or they fix nitrogen in the soil, so they reduce some of our fertilizer issues as well. So things like legumes, uh, things like nuts, uh, fruits, these sorts of things. So we actually get the benefit there as well by even using the some of a tiny sliver of that spared land uh, for a more healthier diet. And interesting what you're saying by leading by example, because it was when doctors stopped smoking that actually the public started to think, hmm, well, if they're stopping smoking, yeah. 
Yeah, and you see, so you see that with the environmental scientists, but you also see that with the nutritional scientists too uh, nowadays in terms of how clear the messaging is now on what a healthy sort of whole food plant-based diet looks like. Terrific. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. For